but Fulani may be more important to Dukakis' chances than Jesse Jackson. And before you laugh, consider this. There are nine states that control 241 of the 270 electoral college votes needed to win the presidency. That means that nearly 90% of electoral votes needed to win are in only nine states. California, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And ironically, because of segregation, blacks are so concentrated in those states that in a close race between the Democrats and Republicans, an organized black vote would swing the election. It would certainly ruin the chances of the Democrats if even a small percentage defected or stayed at home. But if a black independent candidate carried one half of those nine states, he or she could defeat either Dukakis or Bush in 1988. I'm Tony Brown. In a moment, where do Democrats go from here? Tony Brown's journal is brought to you by Pepsi and its bottlers. This program is part of Pepsi-Cola's continuing support of your community's cultural, educational, and business interests. Our guest on this program is independent presidential candidate, Dr. Lenora Falani of the New Alliance Party. <laughs> Dr. Falani, how long have you been running for president? I've been running since June of 1987. I kicked off with the slogan, Two Roads Are Better Than One, which involves supporting Jesse Jackson in the Democratic primary. If Jesse had won, I would have gone with him. But also, just in case he did not, being available to be on the ballot in all 50 states so that the people of this country would have the opportunity to vote for a candidate who stood for the rainbow movement. Now, in that uh, period of time you've been running, you've been called a lot of things, uh, <laughs> one of which is I read an article, quote from an article in Atlanta, uh, and a columnist, and the word kook was used. Mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, see what you're doing as kookish? No, neither do the people who control this country. They, after all, cover kooks all the time. What they're really afraid of is the power of an independent, a black-led and multiracial third party in this country. I've been on a 30-city crusade over the last three and a half weeks out of Atlanta, gone smack dab into the heart of the black community, taking out a message that we need to transform the outrage that we feel at the Democratic Party's selection of Dukakis and Benson into a defeat for the Democratic Party. We need to dump Michael Dukakis and beat them bad and, and let them know that under no circumstances ever again should they take the black vote for granted. Uh, the prevailing logic, of course, is uh, and I have read this, I read an article by a black writer a few weeks ago, and I'm having difficulty following the logic, and that is he didn't like Dukakis, he didn't like Dukakis' choice of Vincent, he didn't like the way Dukakis treated Jesse, uh, he didn't like the fact that Dukakis uh, kicked off his campaign in uh, Mississippi where Reagan did and communicated a white southern strategy, but we've got to vote for Dukakis because we've got to keep Bush out. One of the reasons why that strategy is being pushed by, unfortunately, a lot of black leadership is because they need to hold on to their jobs. But the people in this country are not going to get jobs out of the Democratic Party winning. We have to look, for example, at the promotion of the black agenda that Minister Farrakhan presented in uh, Atlanta the week of the Democratic Party convention. I was outside with a host of black folks, with a lot of progressive people from all over this country, with a number of black leaders who were outraged at what was going on inside the Omni. We may not have all agreed on the strategy and the direction to go, but we knew that what the Democratic Party was doing meant no good for black folks. We have to look at who Dukakis and Benson happened to represent. We have a selection in a year where Jesse Jackson's campaign was the most exciting and powerful and moving thing that happened. We still end up with four white millionaires upon which to choose from. No wonder over half of the people in this country don't vote because that's not a real choice. I'm appealing to my brothers and sisters all over this country, to progressive people all over this country. We have the option, the opportunity to use my campaign to gain leverage from a Democratic Party defeat. Just think on November 9th, them waking up and saying, my goodness, 
black folks did not vote for a Democrat. And not only did they not vote for a Democrat, they voted for a black woman who's an independent candidate, who's basically putting out the message that there are real things that we want. We want jobs, we want education, we want health care, we want a slashing of the budget, and we want that money to revitalize our communities. And if you don't give that to us, we will not give it to you. If we care about a black agenda that speaks to the issues of health care and housing and justice, if we care about the passions and struggles of our people, we have to break out of this two-party uh, monopoly. It's very insulting. It does not work. It's not empowering. I am the tool that the people of this country have in November, in particular in the black community, and it's very, very exciting, and they're scared. They wish I was a kook. <laughs> I read another article in the uh, New York Voice, black newspaper in New York, and the writer said that there were repeated jabs at Jesse Jackson uh, at your uh, at your national at your national convention, the New Alliance's national convention uh, in New York, uh, where you were nominated by your party. Uh, that uh, quote, you uh, wanted to, you did not want to be uh, an important black in the Democratic Party. You wanted to be. Uh, to change politics on behalf of the black community, and that was construed as though it were a jab at Jesse Jackson. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. Well, see, Jesse is not my enemy. I think Jesse has done a brilliant job. He put black folks at the head of a rainbow movement. We are leading a progressive movement in this country with the leadership of the gay and lesbian community, of the feminist community, of the Native American community. We're standing in the midst of history, taking the country in a direction that we've taken this country many, many, many times before because we provide progressive leadership. I think Jesse did a brilliant and splendid job. Unfortunately, Tony, I think he took us to the wrong place because he took us inside a party that would not allow for him to be their leader, that would not allow for him to be one of their candidates. I'm no novice to racism, but when I watched on national TV our brother and leader speaking about the insult the calculated insult of a Michael Dukakis and a Paul Kirk and the Democratic <laughs> National Committee, they could not find a dime to call Jesse up when they knew he would be the first person gone to when this announcement about Benson came out. But they did that because they think they can get anybody, a member of the Klan, put him on the stage, call him a Democrat. Black folks are dumb enough to come out and vote for them, and that we'll just go along with the plan. We absolutely can't do that. So I'm not Jesse's enemy. Even people, I've been a staunch, staunch supporter of Jesse financially. As Every time I took my campaign out, I took his out. In 1988, in November, I'm supporting Jesse even more strongly than Jesse can support himself because he decided to run as a loyal Democrat. If we want Jesse to run in 1992, Fulani is still our best bet because if Dukakis wins in 88, Jesse can't run for eight years. We can't have that happen. We can't put our movement on the shelf for eight more years and watch the Democrats do Reaganomics their style. We really have to come out and take advantage of my campaign. I'm yours. <laughs> What do you think of what she's saying? I think she's right on. Why? Been, Why is she right on? Because I think that seven and a half million of us are just sick and tired of the Democratic Party taking us for granted. Thirty million of us. Well, thirty million of us. Jesse got seven and a half million votes. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. All righty. So we're very happy that there's a Dr. Polani here with us. That's why. Do you plan to vote for? I her? certainly do. I, are I you a member of her party? I certainly am. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is there anyone here who's not a member of her party? <laughs> yes, sir. Stand up, please. I, I am a member of the party. All right. Uh, what I would like to uh, address to Dr. Filani is uh, based on the political situation here, what are you doing to get the attention of the black communication media? As Mr. Brown has stated, they are talking about what the Democrats have done to us, but what the Republicans have, but they have not put you on the front page of their publication. And this is what I think they ought to begin to do. Well, may I say this before you answer, Dr. Filani? I know a lot of what I know about Dr. Filani. I got out of black newspapers. The Houston Defender had a front page, six column headline on her. The New York Voice has reported on her repeatedly, the black American. Now, I don't know if all of them have, but I, I can say to some extent she is, the only place she is being reported on 
is in the black press. I, I agree with you that there are some type, some little article that a particular writer She's not being treated like write. Jesse Jackson is. That's what you She's saying. not being treated yeah. like Jesse Jackson. They're not coming out and saying, we endorse her. They're not, they're, they're not putting her on the front page. Well, aren't sure, we, they might put her yeah. on page nine. Right. But aren't we, uh, Dr. Filani, aren't we going through the transition, many blacks anyway, 90, 95% who voted for Jesse Jackson, through the transition of getting, uh, moving from the success of Jackson to the next step. I read an article by one of his staunch supporters, and the headline was, Jesse, what next? It was not disrespectful that blacks are going to have to make another political move, but the point was, they're now saying, what do we do now? So I don't, I don't know if it's well, a, the black press or not. Point. They say, what should we do now? And Ms. Philan uh, Dr. Philani has already told them what to do. <laughs> so why is the black communication <laughs> addressing that instead of what she's already told them what we should do? Well, I think one of the uh, answers is that uh, uh, blacks in this country control very little in the area of communications. I was amazed when you said you were in Atlanta something as significant as uh, 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 blacks, to yourself in particular, who were there giving another point of view. And I watched all three networks. I never saw, I never knew any of that took place until I read it in a black newspaper. One of the things that's exciting is that what they wanted to do with Atlanta was to pretend like there was no protest. They let us be on the stage. They let us dance in their hotels and come to their convention. And that was supposed to be unity. But there were lots of people before Atlanta, doing Atlanta. People came to me outside of the Omni in the protest site and said, Dr. Fulani, I would love to walk out of the convention, but once you get inside, they lock the door. <laughs> and, <laughs> They're not, they're, these folks are not into democracy, and they definitely are not into people, especially black folks, exerting our choices. You can't fight for the black agenda you within know, the Democratic Party. You too. I, 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 from what I read, it's all I know about you. Uh, your views and Jesse's are almost similar. Both of you are way to the left. Am I accurate? Well, all you have to do to be way to the left in 1988 in America is to say people should eat, they should have health care, they should have decent housing. <laughs> I think, I think the way uh, I'm defining the left and the way it's being defined is, is that uh, who will pay for it. And when you, when you say the government should pay for it, we say it's left. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say the government <laughs> shouldn't pay for it, we say it's, it's to the middle of right. But even Dukakis obviously uh, is running middle to right uh, and uh, he's having a great diffi difficulty with calling himself a liberal. And I would like to say this to the audience before we proceed. We asked the Dukakis campaign for more than two weeks to have a, a representative of the Dukakis campaign here on this program. And after two weeks, they still could not, uh, did not, whatever it is, provide us uh, with, a, with a representative. Thank yes, sir. Um, I'd like to ask somewhat of a controversial question, and I don't want this to be misconstrued as that I wouldn't support you if you were there, but let's just presume that uh, all of us as minorities uh, just go out and vote for you on that day, just for the heck of it, to see what happens, and you win. Um, what? Explain to me and make me feel comfortable that you're prepared to run the country for me for the next four years. Well, one thing that you should feel comfortable with is that I'm not Ronald Reagan. That should put you <laughs> way ahead of it. I guess the, the other point is that I believe that what we need in this country, desperately need, is leadership. The whole issue of relating to qualifications historically relative to the presidential race is that you have to be a white, wealthy, millionaire whose positions are totally determined from the vantage point of General Motors and multinational corporations. I don't pretend to know all of the answers to all of the problems and crises that exist in this country, but I do know that we need much more participation on the part of the American people. I do know that the black agenda is tremendously important. I think that the issue is how does the money of the people of this country get spent. The government can give us nothing other than what we've given to them. And I think what's, what's strongly missing are our priorities being set from the vantage point of us, from the people who've built this country from the ground up. And I could do a tremendously wonderful job in providing leadership to that, as could Jesse, much better than a Ronald Reagan or Michael Dukakis, because we are not their priority. They are experts when it comes to multinational corporations. Jesse and I are experts when it comes to the people of this country. That's Dr. a very Barney, different kind uh, of let's qualification. Let's move aside from whether or not you're, you're able and capable of running America. Is your strategy to run America, or is your strategy to decide who will run America? Well, it's to do both. 
and I'll tell you how come. <laughs> Basically, if we make the decision, for example, in November, of who ends up in the White House, it will elevate and enhance the position of the black agenda, the struggles of progressive people to the top in this country overnight. They will have to sit down, and they won't call me. You know who they're going to call? They're going to call Jesse. And they're going to say, Jesse, what happened? I thought you had your people under control. <laughs> you know, and Jesse can say from a point of dignity and strength and power that the stakes have risen, that my people are saying we want the Jesse Gray housing bill passed for real. We don't think that people should be living on the streets in the wealthiest nation in the world. We want a national health care program for real. We want when the Democrats who control the Congress sit down and talk with, with Republicans about the budget deficit for some decisions to be made relative to the people of this country. We need a national health care program. How is it possible that Reaganomics was able to flourish in the way that it has over the last eight years without complicitness from a Democratic Party controlled Congress. They need to learn how to say no to the Republicans and yes in our behalf. And if they won't do that, then we need to say no to the Democrats. And that's what my candidacy represents. I'd like to ask somebody in the audience to answer this question for me. Blacks have given the Democrats uh, in almost every four year presidential election 90, 95% of the, our votes. Is anyone in here satisfied with what the Democrats have done for blacks as a result? Is there anyone? If it is, you put your hand up. You don't even have to speak. All right, is there anyone in here who is not happy with what black people got for giving the Democrats their votes? <laughs> now, now that, 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 is, that is a statement, a ponderous statement. And I think to some extent, Dr. Polani, many of us who are black are afraid of a black being president. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what many of us have been taught is that we for, number one, are not qualified. I was listening to the show before on term, in terms of stereotypes, and it's very, very important to realize that we ask all kinds of things of black presidential candidates, of, of black everythings, than we do of white folks who are running for the same office. We don't know what uh, Quell's qualifications are. Did you are. serve in the National Guard, Dr. Vallant? <laughs> Mr. Uh, Senator Quayle says he's qualified. Right on. Tell me about it. Yes, sir. Stand up, please. Yes. How you doing, Dr. Falani, right? Yes, I'm doing uh, great, bro. Great. Um, there seems to be uh, a dilemma about the corporation paying taxes. So what I'm about to ask you is pertaining to taxes. Uh, as we all know that the corporation, General Motors, pay less taxes than the individuals is. So my question to you is, what would you do to make a fair deal with the corporation paying taxes as well as individuals? And there's, a, there's, a, there's like a dilemma situation. If the corporations were to pay a lot of taxes, then there'd be less jobs. So how would you rectify or how would you steer that situation? Well, Thank I you. think what we're staring at from is the corporation paying no taxes or a minimum amount of dollars in terms of ta taxes and the majority of people paying, people paying the majority of taxes in this country. That's a problem. I don't think we have to be so beholden to corporations in the way, for example, Ed Koch happens to be in the city of ours. I think we have to be very, very clear about the relationship between the kinds of money that is pulled out of our community and then spent in other places never, ever on our behalf. Congressman Conyers has a uh, bill, for example, that calls for a moratorium on plant closings so that wealthy corporations can decide that they can make more profits some in other, some, some other part of the country or, or the world and just close down and leave thousands of people on the streets without jobs. And I'm not just talking about some wimpish 60-day notice. I think that's an outrageous uh, expression of how little the Democratic Party will fight for the people of this country. Dr. Lani, we're running out of time. Oh, okay. question. I'm, good. I'm just concerned that a lot of very cynical people, um, they're saying don't vote for Dukakis. The difficulty that I have with that is that how that will translate is that a lot of people won't vote. Well, hopefully. And hopefully they will vote for you if they right. choose to not vote for one of the major party candidates. But it is also important to not forget in the national election that things that happen at the state and local level also depend on whether or not you vote. City services. More AIDS babies are born in the Bronx where I work than anywhere else in the city. If people don't vote at the local level for whatever candidate or whatever party of their choice, they will get no services whatsoever. So that 
I'm glad to see you as an alternative. I don't know yet that I would vote for you. I'm glad that you are there, and I'll have to give serious consideration to that. Well, hopefully, the I think people will come to realize that our people did not die in the streets for us to not vote. It's impotent. We don't have to write anybody's name in. We have the opportunity to use my campaign as a way to send a very serious and potent and powerful message to the Democratic Party. They'll be willing to sit down with us on a state and local level, even nationally, in a way that they weren't willing to do in this past, you know, in, in, at the Democratic Party convention, because we hold in our hands something that they need our votes, and they can't win without it. It's a very potent choice to say to the Democrats, not only do we support Reverend Jackson's political agenda, but we will go outside of the party and vote independent in order to hold on to it. It's up to the people in this room and the people in this country who know about this campaign to take the message out that I'm on the ballot in all 50 states in the District of Columbia and rep recognize that that represents history for our people and for the United States of America. Uh, Ms. Falani, you have accented some of the positive aspects of your campaign, but I believe there are a number of negatives which, I, which I'd like you to address. The first is that though you agree ideologically with Jackson, you are in direct opposition to him to the extent that he's enthusiastically supporting Dukakis, openly campaigning for him and not for you. So though you agree with him, you, you can't deny that you're going to be working against each other to the extent you're working for others. And then, secondly, uh, to the extent that Jackson has millions of loyal supporters who agree with his reasoning that, uh, uh, that though we don't agree totally with the Democratic Party, it is our best bet, who are going to follow him. And I hope that you convince uh, uh, many black people and others to support you. Would that create a division in the black community and minority community between those who continue to support Jackson and those who continue to support you? And that would also be a negative. Well, see, I don't think it's a negative, number one, that the black community is not monolithic. I think this dialogue that's going on about which way for the black vote is very exciting. It's what democracy is all about. It's every bit of it. I also want to underscore that Jesse made it very, very clear when he set out to run this time around that he was going to go with the Democratic Party nominee. That's what it means to run as a loyal Democrat. But there are seven and a half million people who gave him our votes who don't necessarily agree with that. Jesse left Atlanta with absolutely nothing, nothing. All of what we worked for, all our passion, all of our energy got transformed into Dukakis and Benson. There is a lot of response to that. I'm out on the streets. I talk to our folks every day. People are saying, boy, I'm sure glad you existed. I didn't know you were running. You got my vote. Tell me what I can do, sister. We need to take this out. We're not talking about divisions. We're talking about there being an alive and passionate dialogue about which way the black vote. We're talking about the black community not being sold on this backward reactionary Dukakis Benson ticket. How dare Dukakis go to Philadelphia, Mississippi on the 24th anniversary of the murder of three civil rights activists and not one word, not one word come out about it and expect black people to vote for him. We're talking about supporting Jesse in November of 88 by supporting his political agenda. That's the exciting thing. That's the important thing. That strengthens Jesse in a way that supporting Dukakis and Benson could never, ever. So people need to come with me. I think that's true, but if you're right, subtly it's a criticism of Jackson in terms of not, uh, you know, a, a lot of, it's a, a growing amount of that criticism not coming out directly and saying uh, Jackson is wrong and uh, misleading the people, but it is going to cause people to have to make a choice. A lot of black people between uh, Jackson's uh, direction in terms of uh, staying within the Democratic Party and leaving it. And second, the, part, the reason the black vote is important is because we are uh, uh, a substantial number. To the extent that we become divided, even though dialogue is good, to the extent that that 30 million or 7 million votes becomes 3 million or, or a lesser fraction, that is, is bound to diminish the value of the black vote as a large block. And that is really our, own, our only uh, uh, base of power and why other candidates should listen to us, because we do represent a certain number of votes, uh, delegates, and so on and so forth. So I think that is something that is a real consideration. Well, the vote, the black vote is already diminished by the fact that many of us don't come out and vote at all for either of the two-party candidates because they always end up being f white 
wealthy millionaires. <laughs> what I'm not being subtly critical about Jesse uh, at all. I think Jesse has done a great job. What I'm saying is that we can't hide behind the job that he did and that brilliant performance and stay home when we have a black independent woman running on his political agenda on the ballot. What I'm also saying is that I think in spite of Jesse's job, he attempted to do it within a party that has no respect for the black community, the black agenda, or the rainbow movement. So we can do something with what Jesse built for us. We can do something with all the potential that he opened up that he can't do by virtue of being loyal to Dukakis and Benton. We don't need to be ashamed of that. We need to be proud and forthright. We need to stand up and say, Jesse, I support Dr. you Fulani. so much, I'm going straight ahead with Fulani. We have less than a minute. Dr. Fulani, unfortunately, we've been geared to pit, uh, pit against one another. But indeed, if you were to split the Democratic vote, Aren't you ensuring Jesse another chance in 1992? Yes, I also want to make it clear that I don't care about the Democratic Party. I wouldn't care if the Democratic Party dissolved overnight. I think it, we deserve to pay that party back. People say I'm a spoiler. I am thrilled to be a spoiler. <laughs> that party has spoiled so many attempts on the part of black people and other disenfranchised people that we should go after it with a vengeance. We should say absolutely not. You spin in our faces. We are not going to support you and use our vote in a very smart and powerful way. Fulani is it. Come out and support my campaign. Productions produces this program and is solely responsible for its content. For over a decade, Tony Brown's Journal has been brought to you by Pepsi and its bottlers. At Pepsi-Cola, we're committed to the communities we serve and their cultural, educational, and business interests. Tony Brown's Journal is available on video and audio cassette. To order, call 1-800-223-1796. In New York State, call 212-206-4006. MasterCard and Visa accepted.